Hey, Galactic here. For a while, I wanted to make a video on this topic. When I first played and researched Iggy for my little no videos, I came across various comments that pointed out something I noticed. Undertale and Iggy have a lot of things in common. I played Undertale first, so naturally I was making the same comparisons when I was going through Iggy for the first time. For example, the two games have branching paths that are referred to as pacifist and genocide routes, with many neutral paths in between. The games also have several flags that trigger small events for small, seemingly inconsequential actions. So I always felt like the games were self-aware, giving a wink at the player by acknowledging their actions, no matter how inconsequential they may seem. Just to clarify, Iggy came out way before Undertale. It was released by Remar back on September 1, 2008, and Undertale made its debut on Kickstarter back in June of 2013, but there's more than just gameplay elements that can be compared. These two games were mostly developed by a single person using the Game Maker engines, and both creators are known fans of Homestuck. Heck, Itch even had a small fan base on the Homestuck forums before they were taken down. As a matter of fact, I never saw Remar and Toby Fox in the same room. Have you? Jokes aside, one fan is still carrying out those adventures to this day. He hosts a Tumblr called Alpha Struck, so if you happen to be a fan of Itchy, why not check it out? I included a link to the site below. But back on topic, I don't want to say Undertale copied Itchy or anything like that. There are plenty of other titles too that did similar things, but there are other similarities I couldn't help but notice. But there isn't a video or article on this topic. The closest I've come across is a couple of Reddit threads that compares the two. However, there are plenty of comments on YouTube and there are fans online that mentions the same thing. So I just wanted to toss my opinion in and show you just how similar these games are, and also how they present their views under different themes. Of course, there's going to be major spoilers for both games, but I assume most folks here have played Undertale, or at least are more well aware of the plot, you know, besides Sans the Skeleton Man. So to save time and be a bit more clear on this topic, I'm going to be going in more depth with Iggy. So spoilers ahead. I've done a synopsis on Iggy's plot like twice now on my channel before, but for those new to the game, I'll be quick. Iggy is the name of the protagonist who's visiting her dad's workplace when she notices a mysterious light in the clouds. Beams of destructive light then come crashing down, and we immediately cut forward to six months later where a team is working together to implant an alien nanofield into Iggy. Before they can awaken her though, the invading aliens break in and kill off the team, leaving her to wake up and see the aftermath for herself. Her brother Dan then speaks over a PA system. He's hiding out in a command center and gives her a quick dose of reality. An alien race known as the Tassin has invaded Earth, and attacked with a weapon known as the Alpha Strike. These barrage of lasers are powerful enough to destroy entire planets, however the attack was dialed back so the Tassin can settle on Earth, since they're hiding from another alien race hunting them down. It takes Iggy some time to face reality before she gets up with her weapon in hand. Her brother has a plan, talk to their leader, and convince them to spare the humans. The Tassin aren't able to understand them since he speaks English, but with Iggy's nanofield, she can comprehend their alien language and speak directly back. It's not a good plan, but it's the best they have, and along the way, she must dodge the alien invaders who are under strict orders to kill every human. There isn't a direct comparison to Undertale's opening, which is simply Frisk climbing Mount Ebbett. By the way, it's too late to fall down there, I'm sorry. Frisk falls on the ground and is shortly greeted by Flowey, who acts as a guide. It isn't until Flowey shows his true color does Toriel come in to rescue you and give you a proper tutorial. Of course, the game just doesn't simply let you spend the rest of your life with her. Like it or not, you're forced to attempt to escape and have to face Toriel herself. She wants to stop you from heading out, but before you do, she gives you a warning. The monsters in the underground are hunting for humans and are trying to gather seven human souls, so they can shatter a barrier that prevents monsters from reaching the surface. After a heartfelt battle, you can finally escape into the monster world where the royal guard and even other monsters are trying to kill you. But that's not the story I want to compare about how these two games lay the groundwork for a pacifist playthrough. These monsters in Iggy are trying to settle in a new home, and the monsters in Undertale want to break out from the underground, where resources are starting to wear thin. In Iggy, the first boss you face is the commanding officer of the Tassin known as Crotera. He doesn't believe coexistence isn't an option since, well, you know, they wiped out most of humanity, and he doesn't want them to revolt against them. Not all of the Tassin believe in this, however. There are logs questioning this logic, but I'll get into more detail in a bit. As you play, Iggy notices that the aliens look a bit human, and really starts to wonder if it's really right to kill him. Dan acts as your guide, and inherently believes that she should if she has to defend herself. By the start of level 3, he notices when you're trying to avoid killing outright, and advises you that trying to keep this up might put Iggy in even more danger. See, Iggy has a level up system too. You gain EXP by picking up nano scattered in the stage. While you can collect bundles without killing anyone, you can earn a good amount by killing soldiers and picking up their own nanofield. So by doing a pacifist run, you have to explore every nook and cranny if you want to level up as much as possible. 
And even then, you'll be left underpowered compared to doing a neutral run. Sure like how Undertale only rewards EXP if you kill monsters, but that's something you want to avoid if you want the pacifist ending. By the time you reach the third stage, the Tassin notices that you're just trying to avoid him and actually forms a truce to let you go, as long as you don't commit any violent actions, not even break down any doors that might lead to some useful goodies. So during a pacifist run, you get a literal free pass to the end of the stage. However, on the way, you come across the dirt alien race I mentioned earlier, the ones that's hunting down the Tassin. These are known as Kamado. Tomato, Kamado, who cares? They were shipwrecked and have a good number of their men killed. And because they're not part of the truce, nor do they know who you are, they start to hunt you down, so you're forced to run and dodge. After them, you finally reach your destination and get to talk with the Tassin general, Crotera, and he's not going to let you walk out alive. In a typical run, this is where the boss fight starts. But in a pacifist run... Yeah, that. And this is where the themes start to play out differently. In Undertale's trailer, it boasts that no monster has to die. And that's true. No matter how villainous or stubborn your opponent is, there is a way to end the fight without having to kill him. However, Itchy's setting is taking place in the middle of a war. Guns and conflict is a constant theme, and these aliens have been on the run from a literal genocide and aren't willing to be so easily persuaded. They will shoot first, ask questions later. So while they both technically have a pacifist option, in Undertale, the theme is you can make friends with anyone if you just try. In Iggy, you're forced to face the fact that sometimes killing in self-defense is justified when the other side isn't willing to reason. Iggy's pacifist rules even reflect this. It's harder to spare people when they're gunning you down in a narrow hallway, and sometimes accidents do happen in a battlefield. So to maintain a pacifist run, your kill count cannot exceed more than 5. Despite this, you can go through the game without killing a single person, However, it is a bit trickier to pull off compared to Undertale, where they nudge the player to seek out this play option, and even then, there's no way to save everyone in Iggy. So because the officer Crotera was killed and people believe Iggy was the one who did it, she is forced to call in that third alien race I mentioned. According to Dan, they're like a space police and were hunting down Tassin because they were alpha striking one planet after another. By the end of stage 4, dialogue might play out differently. If it's a neutral or genocide run, then Iggy will call down a Kamado in a desperate attempt for help. But in a pacifist run, she outright refuses, strictly believing no one has to die. And if she does call them down, then the Tassin and all those who are willing to spare her, and possibly humanity too, will be killed. However, because of the Tassin shooting the Kamado ship earlier, they do find out the Tassin are hiding on Earth, and head over to Earth regardless of the outcome. And here, we could see the thematic difference from Undertale and Iggy play out entirely. In Undertale, you're traveling to towns, meeting up with all kinds of wacky characters who only fight you because it's their job and would rather go out to have ice cream with their bro. Uh, bro, uh, bro. bro. But in Iggy, you are literally in the middle of a war. You go through levels and see the Kamado drop down and fight the Tassin. They will fight each other, and people are going to die, and you cannot prevent this. All you can do is run towards the next objective, and seek out whoever's in charge to convince them to end the violence. And these logs will give you the different perspective of the soldiers as well. You see that not all of the Kamado are doing this for justice. They just want to raise their kill count since they've been genetically engineered for war. You even meet an assassin class soldier named Asha who wants to kill you, not because you're a human, but because it would speak volumes for him to kill the anomalous human who has given the Tassin so much trouble. In this boss fight, you have no choice but to fight with your trusty shotgun. Or you can choose to fight if you know what you're doing. Regardless, you don't actually kill Asha because he'll always end up retreating. It's a tactic assassins use since they're equipped with portable teleporters. So you and Dan trying to figure out what to do next, Dan finds out through communications that the Kamado are planning to not only wipe the entire Tassin race, but Alpha strike the planet completely, so the citizens can know that the Tassin have been completely wiped from the universe. What's worse, the Tassin have been pushed back and are holed up in a final stronghold, so the Kamado are preparing a concentrated laser strike to take them out. So you and Dan work together to reach the Kamado ship to destroy the weapon. However, shortly afterwards, Asher realizes that there's more than one human sabotaging everything and manages to find Dan, kidnapping him and forcing you to lay your weapon down to be killed. And here, another factor comes into play. Earlier in the stage you come across a small mine. There's a little section where you have to dodge Kamada forces in a small room, and Dan hacks the door open. You can use the mine to take out a teleporter to make it easier for yourself, but you can also play dead. However, if you use the mine here, you just seal Dan's fate. At the end of the stage, Asha holds Dan hostage. A teleporter behind you activates and a soldier spawns behind you. Itchy is forced to kill that soldier, or be killed, which in turn makes Asha finish Dan off before warping. This is a bit of a beginner's trap. There's a small dialogue box of Edgy feeling like she forgot something to nudge the player to explore and find the mine. But you wouldn't know in your first playthrough that the mine can be used here as well. 
This reminds me of my first time facing Toriel. I tried sparing her consistently without realizing that you weren't supposed to do anything. I'm dumb, shut up. And I thought I had to whittle her HP down before trying to spare again. Except, you know how that goes for most people. So I restarted and had to feel like garbage over Flowey rubbing it in my face. While there's no fourth wall breaking Flower to mock you and Iggy, you can restart the stage and save Dan all over again, but if you choose to proceed, you see the emotional impact it has on Iggy. She's in denial, talking to herself as if Dan was still there, and honestly, it's heartbreaking. And at first, it may seem like Dan may have survived somehow, but one key thing to notice is that the cameras, the way Dan has been keeping tabs on you, are no longer moving. He's dead. It's just a small detail that makes me appreciate this impact a little bit more. Undertale has cameras hiding all over the place too, just to let you know that you're being spied on. But there's other details too, like Flowey stalking you in the flower fields, or San abandoning his quiche. It just wasn't up for the responsibility. But if you do use the mine on the teleporter, you not only avoid having to kill the soldier, but Asha is forced to let Dan go as well. So that's nice. So next up is meeting the general of the army, Tor. If you've been keeping up on the pacifist route, you get a log message from one at Kamado telling you to keep up the peace, letting you know you're on the right path to meet her. On the way to the general, you come across the Tassin stronghold, which they give you access to since they know you weren't the one who killed Crotera. There, a certain Kamado gives you a challenge to reach the bottom of this abandoned lab and make it all the way back to the top while fighting assassins. Again, assassins flee when taking too much damage, and don't actually die so you can fight them back. You're forced to face two at a time through multiple instances so it's not easy, but persevere and you can finally meet this mysterious assassin named Ansaski. She admits that she too is sick of this warfare, and believes that once the Tassin are wiped out, the Kamado are likely to war amongst themselves since they are in a race of conflict with no other enemy to fight. She warns you of an annihilator named Ayosa, and offers a hand. So in the very next room, you come across Ayosa. She herself was a survivor of an alpha strike that Tassin did to our planet, and she managed to survive due to her experimental nanofield that is far stronger than others, which gives her the name, Ayosa the Invincible. She wants to avenge her friends and family, and won't stop at nothing to seek out her own justice. In order to avoid killing her yourself, you have to have Nsaski on your side. The two talk, but of course Ayosa couldn't see any reason to spare the Tassin since she's out for blood, and is so close to wiping out the last of them. So you two fight, and by having Nsaski's help, you can avoid killing Ayosa. Since Nsaski kills Ayosa herself. Yeah. You can't fight her without Nsaski, and choose to spare her in a certain event. Ayosa is special in the fact that weapons can't actually harm her due to extremely powerful nanofield. However, in this clever boss fight, you actually defeat her by ramming her into a wall and cracking her security to cancel out the nanofield. Here, you can choose to kill or spare. Sparing would be the right thing to do, right? Well, remember what I said earlier about these leaders only knowing conflict and believing your extermination is the only way to end this war? Well, let me just quickly skip to the ending of the game that plays if you spare Ayosa. Yeah, despite preaching peace, Ayosa is a bit of a hypocrite, and sparing her actually spawns a depressing ending where she comes back just to kill you in one powerful blow, while mocking your philosophy. So in order to get the best ending, Ayosa must die since she's far too gone in her beliefs, and there might be some additional psychological traits in here due to the powerful nanofield. Logs get into more details, but they'll take too much time to explain, so let's move on. So to quickly summarize what happens next in Eji, you have to fight Asha again. His obsession has only grown, and he's pretty much abandoned by all his peers, since everyone is retreating from Iggy due to them believing she killed Ayosa. At this point, his only reason to kill you is to prove he's the best. You can meet him later on and engage in a boss fight, however if you do fight him, there is no way to avoid killing him since Ash is willing to fight to the very end. You can avoid him with a bit of weapon cracking, you just have to destroy this core so you can avoid him alright. You pretty much skip the toughest final sections of the game to reach the general. Near the end, you come across some final logs. One keeps track of every single Tassin and Kamado soldier you killed. Hopefully it's empty. And another log shows that Asha was outright humiliated, and because he couldn't kill you himself, he decided to rig a bomb on himself and commit suicide. Or he moved on to Slap City, that's a happier ending too. And finally, you meet Tor. Now, this is a character that is very reminiscent of Asgore. Throughout the game, you find out bits and pieces about Tor, how he doesn't advocate violence. Heck. The logs leading up to him show that he never wanted to come to Earth in the first place, 
It was Ayosa who warned him that if he disregarded the Tassin, then his people would have likely punished him and come to destroy the Tassin regardless of his input. So he feels that he must Alpha Strike the planet, despite Iji's pleas. He is pressured by not only his superiors, but by the entire Kamado race, who won't be satisfied until every single life on that planet is dead. And that's what makes this final boss fight so powerful in both games. Asgore is the king of the monsters, and the one who led the charge on killing enough humans to break them out. You not only stumble upon the possessions of previous humans in the form of equipment and weapons, but you can even see the caskets in the basement. The same thing with Asgore. He never wanted to kill an Undertale. He was struck with grief over how the humans killed his son, Asriel, when he wanted to bring the corpse of his human friend back to the people. Because of the humans killing his son, and the dwindling amount of resources, morale in the underground was low. So he vowed to collect the seven human souls so he can destroy the barrier and free the monsters to give him hope once more despite his wife's disappointment. And you're the very last human. So let me digress and just take a moment to absolutely gush about both boss battles. This is what makes specific bosses in video games stick out. Not only are the context behind both fights amazing, but the fights are excellently well designed, challenging the players every ounce of skill and forcing us to give it everything we got. Both games, if you're running pacifist, this will be the toughest fight of the game. You have no experience to back you up. You have to fight them while you're potentially at your weakest. And these two big baddies are actually just softies, who never wanted to fight. But they're also the most skilled in their field, and feel the pressure of their people on their shoulders. I can honestly see these two getting along a bit too well at Grillby's after a few drinks. And it's just a cherry on top when the song playing reflects this. Both boss themes are incredible, full of emotion and energy, letting you know that this is it. This is the moment the entire game has been building up to. But yeah, while Asgore is not the end for Undertale, this is where the game ends for Iggy. Regardless of what happens, you can't avoid Tor's death, but in his last moments, he does choose to spare the planet, and depending on your actions, who lives or dies, different portraits and characters appear in the ending credits. If you've been doing the true pacifist mode in Iggy, then you can see that the Tassin survived, along with a couple other unique characters. Similarly to Undertale's ending, where you can potentially see a photo of Frisk and their friends if you choose to go back home. There's also a unique neutral ending too, where both Asgore and Tor kill themselves. I guess they just couldn't live with the guilt? But that's just a minor detail comparing the two. There are other similarities between both games, if you choose to be a naughty. Let's move on to the genocide route. For those unaware, the genocide route in both games refers to a specific playstyle. It means to kill everyone in your path. Except in Iji, it's referred to as the Berserker route, but for simplicity's sake, I'll just refer to both as genocide. And in Iji, there is a bit of wiggle room per level, but you do have to go out of your way to make sure you get a few extra kills. In Undertale, it means literally everyone, till there are no encounters left. The plot for Iggy doesn't change too much when you go for a genocide route that is. There are a few key differences however that can relate to Undertale, so let's focus on these changes now that the story has been mostly summarized at this point. As you can expect, the Tassin no longer form a truce. They will continue to engage you as normally. Boss fights also can't be avoided and you'll have no partner as a result. What does change however is the perception of the Tassin. They will acknowledge the fact that you're mowing them down with ease, and Iggy's arguments for why they should spare the humans become weaker when engaging certain bosses, with some of them even calling her out as a hypocrite for trying to advocate peace when she's done nothing but kill everyone in her way. In Undertale, when going through a genocide route, the story changes dramatically. NPCs run away from towns, and the soundtrack that typically plays slow down to give a creepy vibe. The monsters know what you're doing, and they choose to flee, with only a certain few staying behind to stand their ground. Most are wiped out in one hit however, but there are a couple of bosses for the player to fight and they can be the toughest in the game, forcing the player to memorize fast and sometimes cheap patterns to break through. But I digress, there's a few psychological effects that happen between both characters as well. For example, in Iggy, when you first start to kill, she actually apologizes, I'm sorry, showing just how green she is on the battlefield. 
and how she initially doesn't want to kill anyone. However, the more you kill, the more she becomes quiet, and if you kill enough, she no longer apologizes. She'll actually start to mock her opponents. <laughs> you die! Her voice also becomes more aggressive in general, like when jumping or kicking. In Undertale, the more monsters you kill, the less likely random encounters will happen. The save point acts as a counter now, letting you know how many are left, and it can be maddening to find a few additional monsters to kill, just to proceed with the genocide route. The game almost acknowledges this too, since at a certain point, the random encounter bubble gets replaced with a smile, showing that the player is happy they found someone to kill. I use this cheap trick to speed up encounters too. It works, but now I have a bad habit of doing this every time I can walk to the right alongside a wall. I think it works only on PC though? I don't know though, you can't move to the left either, so it's just a weird trick. Anyways, back on topic. The more you kill, the less the monsters actually recognize you as a human, and the less control you have over yourself. An additional detail to note is the fact that certain texts also change, becoming more pessimistic, like the dog food being half empty, and red text indicates that someone else within you might be talking instead. But that's just a side plot that I can't get too much into without wasting more time, so let's move on. Both games also have instances where unique characters getting killed creates changes for the players to see for themselves. Take Grillbees for instance. Each dog you encounter on the way to Snowden will appear here if you choose to spare them. For every dog you kill, they will no longer show up, letting you see the ramifications when everybody else is starting to ask what happened to X, Y, or Z. There is a similar thing with Iggy, although to a smaller degree. There are a couple of Tassin NPCs named Meja and Wakatorma. They're in a relationship, however they've been assigned to different sections, and as a result they've been separated. Without reading logs, you wouldn't realize that this basic Tassin scout right here, before General Cortero's room, is anything special. But by killing her, you changed Wakatorma's fate as well. If the two make it out alive, they teleport together later in the game. But by killing too many men, and Sasuke isn't there to help anymore, and Ayosa strikes at the last Tassin stronghold, killing everyone inside, including Wakatorma. By reading the log right before her corpse, Eiji will realize what she had done and assimilates Wak's Nana field as a way to keep her spirit alive before moving on. This also reminds me of the two royal knights I previously mentioned earlier. In a pacifist run, they become a couple, but in a genocide run, they become much more serious, knowing their captain has been killed, so they act as a roadblock to the player, knowing they'll die just to stall for time. Yeah, these two bros are in the lineup for my favorite bromance, second only behind the man Sassins. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! When you sleep. What? And now, let's talk about the player getting less input for both games during the genocide route. In Undertale, your character steps forward on their own during conversations, interrupting NPCs. And it's done without the player's input to foreshadow the ending. It's pretty rude though, not letting poor Papyrus set up his puzzles or his japes. But by the end, your character is attacking regardless of your input now, taking out Sans after a long battle, and eventually Ascor and Flowey himself in a brutal display. You find out at the end that any little bit of control is taken over by the true human. Their presence was evoked by starting this route, and they will destroy your game if you choose to oppose them as well. And I do mean destroy your game literally. Scary. I mentioned before that Iggy doesn't break the fourth wall to that extent, but similar things happen. In neutral or pacifist runs, you still have the option to spare Ayosa at least, but by going the genocide run, Iggy will shoot regardless of your input. And by having at least 300 kills by the end of the game, you get a special option to kill Tor, and by showing no mercy to Tor, she has sealed her planet's fate. At the end of a radio transmission from Tor's armor, it reveals that he had no intention of alpha striking the planet. But his second in command saw just how ruthless Iggy was and judges all of humanity based on her. As a result, the ending involves a Kamado Alpha strike in the planet. There is a small difference if Dan is alive, but the only difference is that you two are seen hugging each other right before the beams come crashing down. And in the end, the Kamado are celebrating the complete eradication of their enemy and the destruction of planet Earth. To be fair though, although complete destruction is similar for both games, this special genocide ending in Iggy, along with a couple of other endings, were recently added in 2017, as of Iggy's 1.7 update, so take that information as you will. But still, these were many similarities I found through my many playthroughs of both games. Each one reminded me of the other, and each title gives their own context and interpretation of the age-old question of whether or not you should kill or spare. Whether one game does a better job than the other is irrelevant since, in my opinion, 
they're still completely different games that just happens to have pacifist and genocide routes. They weren't the first in the field either. Heck, Itchy itself was inspired by Deus Ex's pacifist route and a plethora of other games too. If you're interested, you can check out the Asha Ludono to see a number of references tossed into Iggy. Be warned though, the audio levels are a little wonky since I wouldn't, I'm still an amateur, let's just admit it. But Undertale was definitely a big influencer in this genre, which is why it gets compared with all these other titles. And I feel like Iggy could have been an inspiration for Toby Fox if he played it, given their similar backgrounds. He's pretty tight-lipped about Undertale in general though, which just leads me to believe that he wants to emphasize the fact that he wants all of us, the individual players, to not only have our unique experiences, but our own interpretations as well. Same thing with Iggy. I feel that it focuses more on the psychological effects of our choices and how we should preach what we teach and not say one thing and do another. Anyways, I'm getting off topic. There was another topic I wanted to bring up, which was the many secrets hiding in both games. Like how Undertale has a secret meta story hidden within the game's files that you can only come across via file manipulation. And Iggy? Well, it requires having a keen eye, creative imagination, and a dedicated player to unlock all the secrets. And there's just not one layer of secrets too. You need to know secrets to find hidden secrets, which in turn unlocks a whole nother layer of secrets. But that's another video for another time. Thanks for watching. I sincerely hope you enjoyed this video. Yo, I just wanted to add some post credit thanks for some friends. Again, I want to give a shout out to the Alpha Struck Tumblr for keeping the itchy scene alive. They also helped me make revisions and small changes to the video. You can see that I uploaded my works in progress on my Ludosity fan channel, which was the previous name of this channel. They're not the only ones I know keeping the scene alive, however. I know a Mugen creator by the name of Puffalotti. He's also working on making nearly every character in Iggy for a Mugen game. All his assets are free for non-commercial use too. I also want to thank Garcia Rael for giving me permission to use their amazing art that was used for the video's thumbnail. Give them a watch on DeviantArt. And of course, all of my portrait art was created by Lazy Radley. Can't forget them for making me look sexy. <laughs> that was terrible. The links for everyone involved are below. Lastly, I want to thank everyone on Discord that gave me the motivation to finish this project that I started practically a year ago. Thanks guys. Uh, sorry it took me so long. <laughs> well, see ya.